Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Ralph Hexter. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first event in the 2017-18 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. For the few of you who might not be familiar with this series, the UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 and presents about a half dozen lectures every year from experts with a range of perspectives and from a range of disciplines. The series was designed to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public about the serious challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and consider the way the public university is evolving with the ultimate goal of helping to produce a public university that will best serve society and individuals, this series poses the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? We're getting this season off to a very strong start with this lecture today by UCL professor Sylvia Hurtado, who will address campus climate and diversity with special focus on STEM disciplines and how we might better address disparities and boost success for underrepresented students. But before our moderator formally introduces her, I have a few thank yous and a few announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who made this event possible. First and foremost, Professor Hurtado for generously agreeing to travel to Davis and for her knowledge and expertise. Next, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin Kenny, Professor of Human and Community Development, and also Marcella Cuellar, Assistant Professor in our School of Education, who will serve as the moderator of today's event. Finally, I want to thank the three campus units that have joined my office to sponsor this lecture, the Community and Regional Development Program, the Center for Regional Change, and the School of Education. Just a moment to look ahead. I encourage everyone to attend as many of our upcoming forums as your schedule will permit. The next one, which will be on January 25th, will feature Michael Storper, Director of Global Public Affairs at the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. There seems to be a theme here. And uh, Mary Walshuk, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Public Programs and Dean of Extension at UC San Diego. Professors Storper and Walshuk will consider the economic impacts of public universities as they explore the reasons the cities of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego experience and experienced such different dynamics and outcomes. For information on these and all future public forums and, access our, and to access our video archive of past events, please visit the series website at forums.ucdavis.edu. Finally, I want to make sure that you know that after Professor Tato's lecture, there'll be a question and answer period, followed by a reception on the balcony with other goodies to, to sample. You're all invited to stay and keep the conversation going. And now I'm very happy to yield the podium to Professor Cuellar. Thank you so much, Provost Hexter. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Marcella Cuellar, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Education here at UC Davis. It is an honor to introduce Dr. Silvia Hurtado, who is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies uh, within the Division of Higher Education and Organizational Change at UCLA. Dr. Hurtado's scholarship on student development, campus climate, and diversity has influenced the field of higher education in innumerable ways throughout her academic career. She has shaped the way that scholars and practitioners think about these important issues and how universities can create transformational change to achieve the public good in an increasingly diverse society. One of Professor Hurtado's first publications back in 1992 was entitled The Campus Racial Climate, Contexts of Conflict. In this piece, she examined the various elements that shaped the student perceptions of a hostile climate during the 1980s, and this was a time when there was a lot of racial tension on college campuses. She found that multiple factors outside of the university, but also within universities, influence how students perceive the racial tensions within a campus, and this really laid a critical foundation to understand campus climate more deeply. Since then, her research has illuminated the various dimensions that constitute the campus climate and its impact on students' experiences and outcomes, particularly those students who come from minoritized communities. 
More than 25 years since that first publication on campus climate, we know that this topic remains a critical issue in higher education and perhaps more today than ever given this, the current sociopolitical climate in our country. We've seen several examples of the political and racial tensions across the country enter onto our college campuses, including some of our own UCs in this past year. And here. <laughs> and Dr. Hurtado's campus climate work continues to provide important insights on how we examine these tensions and how colleges and universities are preparing students to participate in a diverse democracy. Professor Hurtado has also been very committed to ensuring that this research impacts policy and practice. For example, along with her colleagues at the University of Michigan, her scholarship on the educational benefits of diversity were critical to upholding affirmative action in the 2003 Supreme Court case. Dr. Hurtado has also worked to ensure that institutional actors who can enact change on their campus also have access to the most current research on climate and diversity. During her time as UCLA's director of the Higher Education Research Institute, she created a new survey, the Diverse Learning Environment Survey, which is now available annually for institutions to collect their own data on their own campus climates to inform their own improvements. She has also created the Diversity Research Institute, which is a summer conference that brings together scholars and practitioners to disseminate current research and learn about advancing diversity efforts in their own campuses. Over the last 10 years, she has been examining another critical issue, the underrepresentation of African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans in our STEM fields. She has surveyed and interviewed students majoring in STEM from their first year of college and into their professional and graduate pathways. She has also conducted several case studies of institutions who have developed innovative approaches to diversifying the STEM pipeline. And she's currently working on a book highlighting this longitudinal work, and we'll see this published soon, right? Um, Yes, <laughs> to continue to inform how other institutions can also follow suit in uh, improving these inequities. Now, I would like to turn the floor to Dr. Silvia Hurtado, so please join me in giving her a warm welcome. So thank you, this is a great honor to be here. I have been on the campus before, I talked um, with uh, California Cultural Centers. They invited me to come and talk, and at that time I shared data that we had nationally about cultural centers, and there wasn't a lot, but actually it was very helpful, and it was great to interact with people who are engaged, um, to understand really that their context is not unique, that a lot of the issues they face are issues that are prominent elsewhere, and I think that's what the data help to do. Um, today, I'm going to really talk about actually some emerging work and some publications that are coming out in a couple of weeks, so it'll be new stuff. Uh, and in fact, I was in the hotel room uh, still coding data for a paper that's due next week. Um, and I decided to share a little bit about that because actually it's relevant to the UC system in terms of some of the things we're learning. So a lot of what I'm sharing is fairly new. Uh, it's not gonna be out there except for, I'll tell you which sources are out there uh, now, but um, it helps me when I'm preparing or talking to groups to actually put out some of the ideas that I'm working on to sort of say, well, that makes sense, or that really helps, right? So my goal with all the work that I've done is really to provide information so colleges can become better places for our students and better places to serve a diverse democracy. So generally that's been my, my work and um, thank you so much for that great introduction. I was like, wow, I, I, I sound good. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Dr. Cuellar. So, um, so let me go ahead and get started. And so just some key points that I do want to uh, be a little provocative maybe today uh, and encouraging uh, UC Davis, which I have a lot of respect for. By the way, I used to be chair of the Board of Admissions in relation to the schools, and I worked with your faculty here, who I love, actually. I, I've, I've become good friends with some of the faculty, well, across the UC system, but I remember the Davis faculty really well. So um, the first is really, I'm gonna really talk about UC 
becoming a Hispanic serving system of institutions. What does it sound like? How is it happening? Is it happening? What are some of the key issues we need to be concerned about as those kinds of institutions? Because previous work has really focused on mostly very broad access institutions that are Hispanic serving institutions. Oh. So, so, so I want to kind of ask the question, is this a case of shifting identities? What's going on? So I have a little bit of a framework that is in uh, my recent HSI book, co-edited book, and it's basically um, a, a notion of really shifting identities to really adopt either commitment to diversity or in this case shifting to what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution. And in that case, Hispanics have serving institutions are extremely committed to diversity. They're extremely diverse institutions. So it's not just Latino students they're serving, but they're serving a, an array of groups. And um, we may be changing what that means in the future. And I think some of the work that Dr. Cuellar, you have an expert here actually who will be monitoring some of those changes. So the second thing I do wanna talk about, and that's really kind of building on a lot of the case studies that we've been doing both in the STEM research, but also on retention research. And then more recently, my work with the medical school in National Institutes of Health have uh, developed a diversity program consortium and they've invested multi-millions of dollars in 10 campuses. They've already been selected and they've been engaged in their work. Myself and colleagues at the School of Public Health, the medical school, and also in other parts of the School of Education, we've been working together to develop the evaluation of what's actually happening on the ground. And so I'm gonna give you some insights on that because it's actually informing a lot of the other work as well. And though they're new, um, there's actually a publications coming out in a couple of weeks also that might be useful. In that piece, I talk about a model of inclusive science. And what does that look like? And I built this part based on what those 10 institutions are actually doing. What does it look like? How are they defining inclusive science? That might not be what all their institutions do, but actually campuses are actually engaged in doing some of this work, which to me I think is uh, kind of pushing the envelope and thinking about some of the things we do. And I want to give along the way examples of campus strategies. And uh, so for achieving equity, student success, and then building, as I said, on three projects that all involve mixed methods uh, studies and also particular case studies institutions. And so, so a lot of uh, my students who, former students who are in the audience, they know, what, are you doing qualitative work? Because they, I, of course, it's easier and quicker to publish the quantitative work, right? And the qualitative work takes a longer time to get out. I told an editor once, he said, I didn't know you did any qualitative work. And I said, I do it all the time. It's just it takes so long to get it out, you know, right? Anyway, so I'll, I'll be talking about some early findings from that work. So let me start with, and this comes from the diverse learning environments, the diverse learning environment survey. And basically it shows that the more diverse the campus becomes, that uh, Latinx students begin to experiencing fewer and fewer incidents of discrimination and bias, okay? So the, the ones that have uh, less than 20% underrepresented students, they have the highest rates of reports on a survey, uh, on these climate surveys. When, a stu when an institution becomes uh, more diverse, as uh, Davis is approaching this middle ground here, um, we see a decline in experiencing different types of discrimination begin to decline. And of course, the most diverse institutions have fewer students reporting these things. And so one is that um, when you're the one and only, a lot of issues are gonna happen to you because everyone else in the environment is not used to having people from different uh, backgrounds, whether that's income, but race, ethnicity is a huge one, international status, all of that, right? So there could be many more incidents. And when you have more choice of who you associate with, and there are more of different groups, some call it a critical mass of students, and in fact some institutions try to admit a critical mass so that they can avoid these situations, um, that you really have less bias and discrimination going on. So that's one thing to sort of think about. Um, so if you think about 
kind of Davis in this middle ground here, you're going to see declines, but that doesn't mean it ever goes away. And even in the most diverse institutions, people still have uh, what, cultural missteps or even uh, because of their background, socialization, where they grew up and their differences, there's still, still going to be this, this, these missteps in intergroup relations, I think, and a different part of my work I talked about with other people today, but has been working on intergroup dialogue to understand those differences, and I'm happy to answer questions. Today I'm not talking about dialogue, I'm talking about institutional level kinds of issues. So I want to turn to the question of, is UC really becoming a Hispanic serving system of institutions? And so uh, the thing is, it, um, I will say Riverside was the first campus that became an HSI in terms of federal designation. Merced followed, Santa Cruz followed, and then when UC Santa Barbara became an HSI, it was the first AAU institution. AAU is representing the top 62 or so institutions you research universities in the country, it was the first AAU institution. They made a big splash about this, obviously. Um, and then more recently, UC Irvine became an HSI, and that got uh, a lot of press as well. So I understand UC Davis just hit its number of 25% this year, so it'll be moving into the top category as you apply for HSI status. And I will say, for example, that um, UCLA and San Diego, their numbers actually have been increasing as well, so they may be reaching that status, but uh, may take a little bit longer, and maybe much longer for Berkeley and UC San Francisco uh, in terms of their, their student population. So if you look at the next side of the chart is really the uh, uh, Latinx faculty that are at these institutions. And at first I thought the numbers were wrong. And I was at a meeting last week, several of us were at a meeting last week, and we said uh, UCOP was there. And they said, oh no, Sylvia, those numbers are right. So these are correct numbers of latter domestic Latinx faculty. You may have international faculty that make these numbers a little bit higher in terms of uh, Latinx faculty, but these are the domestic numbers. And they're all a part of this URL you can go into. They do need to update the data. Uh, so these are 2015 data. You may have made hires in the last couple of years that have changed these numbers, and I hope that's the case. But what we're seeing is then, of course, that the faculty numbers are not matching the student changes in the student body. And this is just looking at Latinos, um, and the other groups also are facing the same issue. Another component of that is looking at uh, administrators. Uh, now among uh, general staff personnel, it looks pretty good, but senior management group and also the professional class of uh, administrators, they, it's, it's described in the accountability diversity report from UCUSP as it's still challenging, which is an understatement really. In other words, we have a long way to go because our faculty are not going to match our students, our, sta our senior management group is not going to match our student bodies. And so that means then what? The rest of us, the rest of the group have to really think about how you work with Latinos, how you work with a more diverse student body if you continue to grow in that direction. So that means a lot of us who went through when the numbers were smaller, we did not have uh, Latinx faculty mentors. We had other mentors, right? And that's going to be still the case for some of our students um, because our numbers are still very small. So that just sort of kind of posits is that are we going to catch up? Is this not going to be part of who we are as a research institution and also Hispanic serving institutions? We need to really know that. So the question then is, and I got a call from Santa Cruz, basically, when they were applying for the HSI grant, and they said, we're about to become an HSI, and so we're submitting the grant. And I, I'm thinking about the history of Santa Cruz. It started as the only public liberal arts institution in the country, and then they were pushed into the mold of UC, right, to adopt the identity of a research university, and then now they're going to adopt another identity as a Hispanic serving institution. I, I asked the provost, how are you going to sell that to faculty? That these changes then are, um, are you going to be Hispanic enrolling or you're actually going to be serving these students? That means you're changing your identity in some way. So here's a model, this comes, this is in the HSI book. 
Um, and basically, it shows, for example, on the right-hand side, is the stable identity of the institution, how it's been known, how people have developed its culture, its organizational saga, what this place is known for. For example, if you ask somebody walking down the street who we are as an institution, they'll be able to tell you something, right? And one of the things would be part of that stable identity, and it's certainly embedded in the cultural practice. On the other side is what the transitioning identity might be of an institution. That is, we're changing, we're becoming something. In this case, let's just say Hispanic serving, you want to become Hispanic serving. If you're going to start signaling that, then you really need to think about what happens at the cultural level. Now, campus leaders, they work on this construed external identity, building reputation, projecting images, helping to introduce maybe this new identity. Um, and, but also, uh, the best kind of transformational change occurs at the deepest level, and that's at the grassroots level, uh, changing daily practice, right? How, the, how that's going to change daily practice. And uh, I want to say later in some of the case studies, I'm pretty inspired by how some of those daily practices are changing. It's hard to believe, but it is happening. Um, so the campus leaders can do it, but also a lot of it depends on what I call grassroots leadership. Those who are working at the ground level with students, they come up with new ideas, they develop the programs, they run the programs, they know what works, they, don't, they know what doesn't work. Um, and they are always skeptical when a new identity is introduced because they are cognizant of this past identity and this future identity that's attempted to be developed, right? So they see it as temporal and they really want to see the talk match the walk in terms of changing some of their values and beliefs. And I've seen this on campuses that have been committed to diversity, where the leadership has been able to actually change the daily conversations of people. And they even have like a mantra, you know, like I can't even remember what the name of it, but to a person that we interviewed, they could say the same thing. Um, and it was almost like a new campus motto about where they were headed. It was amazing to see that cultural change within an institution. An important group of people are those who I call middle managers or mid-level leaders. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's the grassroots leaders, and here are the mid-level leaders. The mid-level leaders are like deans, um, uh, people who actually understand what the what the campus leaders are trying to do at the top in terms of changing the image or moving the image toward a, toward a new identity, but they also are very much in touch with what's happening at the grassroots level. And in some cases, some of these mid-level leaders are absolutely critical to helping campus leaders uh, actually achieve their goals. And I'll give an example of one campus in a bit, um, uh, and one campus actually was doing that in terms of changing teaching and learning in, in STEM areas. So this gives you just an idea of some institutional change using organizational identity as a theory to understand some of those processes and how the groups really might uh, determine some of these things. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the organizational learning definition and you see as a learning organization. A learning organization is an organization skilled at creating, acquiring, transferring knowledge. That sounds like UC. Uh, and at modifying its behavior to reflect this new knowledge and insights. Mm, yeah, well, some are. I will say that I do have a case study of in a UC campus that is um, doing that. But I would say, you know, we have to really figure out, well, how does that process work? Garvin really thinks this organizational learning relates to behavioral change, which then will result in improved institutional outcomes, whether that's retention or whether that's improving STEM degree production or achieving equity, you know, those institutional goals. Well, this is a little simplistic because it doesn't always work like that because one of the things that you have to do is start changing mindsets, right? It's like behavior's not going to change unless mindsets begin to change. And that's really adopting um, maybe a growth mindset, talent development, what we're here for, et cetera, thinking about some of those things. But again, people can actually be uh, bought into the idea. They'll say, oh, yes, yes, we agree to that. We think equity is important, but they don't know how to get there. In other words, the behavioral change won't happen unless you actually have um, effective practices, uh, ways to train people to think about and do something better, let's say changing their teaching in the classroom, right? Provide models and examples 
faculty development, and then also feedback. That is, you can't expect people to change the behavior if they don't know what to do, right? So another way to think about it is, yeah, you might have people that are engaged in the mindset, but they don't know what to do, is thinking about helping people to get there. And so we're seeing some of that element. The other is, once you do that, you can't have like one or two individuals, but you want diffusion of this intervention, this innovation, whatever you're doing, to actually result in buy-in. And there are, for example, in the STEM area, for example, the whole departments that are bought in. They'll say, we're doing it, we're reforming, all of us are into it, we're doing it. And then we have other departments that are not doing it at all, right? Okay, so it's, it's diffusion and buy-in is happening. Uh, and as Carl Wyman says, he, he actually supports that whole department acceptance of that and moving forward in that regard. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of some of the diffusion that's going on, but it's a little more with an internal pressure um, happening. So the final thing is really, this is not going to happen without some kind of accountability. And that accountability, I mean, really understanding where you were, like benchmarking and where you were going, how you were achieving those goals, but also accountability in terms of who's responsible for some of the change. Okay, a good, uh, a lot of work we're doing now in retention is like, uh, and I have one particular student that's studying these retention coordinators on campus, right? And it was like, how, what kind of authority do they have? You know, do they really have any budget? You know, what's going on with these? They're, they're charged with a huge duty and that's improving that outcome, but they have to deal with the rest of the campus to buy in to that, right? So it's, it's really understanding how strategic these individuals are becoming. All right, so let's look at uh, some, an element of organizational change. So this gives you a sense of, <clears throat> this is what we're building on this model for using organizational learning to understand how change happens. Many campuses are using now data and research, uh, even what would they call predictive analytics, to really start to understand what's happening on campus, much more so. We're pushing that envelope, and we're hoping that's changing mindsets, but not always. What it could be is helping to find information to target the problems where they are. And I'll give you an example uh, later. But also then thinking about you know, diffusing the knowledge and then changing behavior, sustaining change. That's sort of the cycle, but we're filling it in with actual case study and some areas. So one of the things we found is that it always helps to have external pressure, right? So one is, for example, the UCOP president, hey, get those four-year graduation rates up. And so guess what? Everybody marches back home and say, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it, we're gonna do it because they said so, right? <laughs> because we're going to do it. So then things start happening. So it's great to have internal, now you may have had initiatives internally, but now they take on greater importance, particularly those that are successful. And then they begin to think about how do we evaluate what they're doing, the ones that were not as successful, for example, and understanding that. So it always helps to have some external pressure. Sometimes that external pressure is because of some of these major incidents when it comes to the climate. So training and development and it is also very important to changing the mindsets. And so we begin to think about uh, to change behavior to really implement that. Then buy-in and relationships to really start building those relationships so you know in order to say, sustain the change, and then also the accountability component. So I'm gonna give a little bit of an example of um, navigating power is another part of it. And sometimes it's like thinking about the different levels of leadership, right? Campus leaders, mid-level leaders, and grassroots leaders, thinking about how they might work together or navigating around. And sometimes it's working around people to get things done. There's a lot of things, and I think as I told uh, my colleagues in the higher ed program, we're not teaching our students enough about navigating the politics of institutions, right, in terms of how they work. Now, we're not sure if they'll help them, hopefully it'll help them to be more, more effective. Okay, so here's an example. It is a UC campus that's doing a lot for, um, a lot for retention rates on campus. And one of the things that's uh, pretty clear is, um, it's a bit inspiring, actually, to go and, and interview people and have people talk about this. Um, this particular person, this is a provost, says, I mean, the really remarkable thing, right, is that there's a very low difference between the success rate of our majority students and minority students. 
I mean, that to me is what's really stunning about this campus. Why is that? I think it's because of things that have been going on at this campus for a long time to help students feel very welcome here. So what they've done in terms of, by the way, we did this uh, quantitative analysis nationally of students that had um, full cohorts of students that had answered our national surveys, and then we connected it with the national clearinghouse data to see how students were performing and how institutions were performing for first generation, low income, and underrepresented groups. So we picked campuses and we ended up picking this campus as one of the first one because it was the top nationally. Subsequently, in other rating systems for completion for those particular groups, it's come up really high, so it's kind of confirming the group. So what we found there I think is really important. The other thing is, is that the institution was totally committed to diversity, and they weren't just saying it, uh, but we heard it in almost every interview. And of course, it's a very diverse campus. But they also had what I call a growth mindset, right? That's, Carol Dweck's been talking about that. And he, the provost says, I think there's a lot of untapped quality out there among the underrepresented populations that the fact of the matter is we can bring to our campuses and in the right environment they will succeed. Take a walk around campus. You can't help but root for these students to succeed. He also stated, and also several other interviews stated, that faculty come here because they want to work with first generation, low income, and underrepresented groups. They come here because those are the students they want to teach. So they're actually hiring people that are really committed in those areas, and um, it's actually playing out uh, really importantly. Another component of what they were doing was with the fusion of innovation that is improving what they were doing in teaching, but also to introducing kind of an accountability system and assuring that departments help to meet these goals. So this is a very long quote, but I think the biggest thing um, that, oh, I'm sorry. This is a long quote, but the biggest thing that um, the, uh, the provost basically says, the biggest thing we've done is we've hired what we call a lecturer with security employment. You know, there are some UC speak for you. Uh, basically, it's a permanent teaching faculty member whose job it is, is to both teach first year math, but also to run the first year math program. And so now the first year math is being taught by somebody whose job is, or as I put it, somebody who gets out of bed in the morning and asks, asks himself this, in this case, how do I teach math better to these 18-year-olds, right? So we've done that in math, and we've done that in chemistry, and then we're getting to work in biology. Chemistry is where we started, but the math is where the problem is. They had done the analysis. They'd done a lot of analysis, and they were seeing how students were failing and how math was a prerequisite for a lot of courses, right? So not being able to pass the math, they realized, let's solve the math problem. They decided to do that collectively, but chemistry was already ahead of the game. They knew what the problem was, and they started to do this. So basically, they said, um, it's a big battleship to turn, but chemistry has shown that you can do it. And they were using kind of evidence-based data to show this. So having seen the model and chemistry at work, we went to the math department, and we got in a tussle. And what I did probably differently from the previous provost is I basically said, you're not getting one line until we address this problem, freshman performance in math. And finally, someone or some people or some faculty within the math department basically said, let's step up to the plate and address this problem. Um, so he basically said, and then he says, this is working with a mid-level manager, the dean's office in the College of Natural Agricultural Science was kind of key. Let's call it, they sort of play good cop to my bad cop, right? And we're in the first year, um, but they hired uh, uh, the uh, security of employment, the, the lecturer with security employment in math. So they decided they were going to then do the analysis to see how that was going. So. I have heard this in other institutions that are doing really well, uh, public universities um, that are really well known, by the way. They're also doing this, and they're hiring discipline-based specialists. I know the Ed School was sort of planning maybe something about helping with that in terms of uh, teaching. Um, but basically, it's really a good strategy. Even in uh, institutions that have been resource strapped, they've actually decided instead of hiring tons of lecturers part-time and they don't know who teaches the class, no one trains them, uh, they're fortunate if they return again, um, they actually decide to hire these lecturers with uh, security of employment. And so they're turning things around with that campus. All right, 
So let me talk a little bit about um, what my inclusive science model is. Um, and I want to talk about this because, as I said, I built on the 10 campuses that are working, and this article will be out in about two, two or three weeks, um, and biomedical uh, central proceedings. Um, so this is really thinking about advancing institutional practice. Now, most campuses that have STEM initiatives is they've focused on the training part, they're thinking about curriculum changes, uh, like introducing authentic research in the curriculum, for example. They're usually program activities uh, for this group because they get external funding, really, typically. Some of them are able to institutionalize, but a lot of them begin with external funding to have very specific advising, to have very specific uh, career development, to also have a peer group, and also then faculty mentoring as part of those, some of those program activities. And then a lot of them are also building very powerful partnerships with, uh, with high schools, with industry, with a number of areas to create internships, for example, um, which is this previous uh, campus I was referring to also was doing that. They really were doing, they had done a great job with undergraduate research, and now they were building internships for their students. So this inclusive science is like, what's this idea? It's, is it at the center of this, or what's going on? So here's my model now. So the main thrust of this major national uh, initiative has been really to increase the participation of diverse researchers. But it doesn't happen like magic, right? There's a number of things that campuses are doing and I think is beginning to help define what inclusive science is. First of all, there are 10 to issues of the curriculum. That is, they're actually looking at some of the diversity innovations in science. For example, teaching students about health disparities they're actually incorporating some of the issues that are pertinent in uh, minority communities that surround their campuses in important health problems, environmental problems that they can get students interested in in helping to determine um, how to change that, right? To help them get both the science, but also using some of the relevance related to that. Another component, and I'm going to talk more, is they're actually thinking, scientists are actually taking science educators about improving the climate for diversity in a variety of ways. They're building connections with diverse communities and culturally responsive practice. I have slides on these, so I'll come back to them. And another component is they're beginning to recognize this integration of science identity with one's own racial, ethnic, and gender identities. Talking about them as integrated and not separate, having role models that integrate them, and there are actually some really great ones. And there's also some organizations that are doing that in, in an important way. So let me go ahead and go into a little bit of each of those. Um, the climate. I think is important. It's, it's, it seems unusual, but believe it or not, scientists are reading about what we're doing in the social science area and what we're doing in education, which I found heartening because they said, well, if we really want to turn things around, we want to do things different, we need to build on what research. What do we know about underrepresented groups? And so to me, this is great, right? It's like, hey, it's giving me a whole new beliefs on what I do, basically. It's like, okay, what you did in diversity at the University of Michigan, can you do this for science? And when NIH said they had a competition for R01 GRAP, I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. And so I did it. Um, 12 years later, <laughs> we're still engaged in that uh, analysis and, and thing, findings. And now this led to this more recent work with them. So, the studies that we've done long term on STEM, and particularly looking at transition and adjustment to college, is we found that students' perceptions of the climate affected their academic adjustment and their sense of belonging. This was true for underrepresented students in science. Climate affected almost every single group when we broke down the groups, science and non-science. So climate was really important. And that continues the work that I started earlier in understanding Climate is not just something like is in the air, goes and comes, or whatever, but it has real consequences, right, for students. And so that's really the research base. So these institutions were saying, well, we need to act on that. They were creating what I call an ethos of a growth mindset. In fact, they had the little poster of the growth mindset that were reminding students. And some of the students, they call them uh, the build scholars, was like, OK, we're tired of hearing this. You know, students say, we're over that, right? Once they hear it once, it's like it's a new idea, and then after that, Mm, it's not such a new idea, you know. They're pretty 
you know, it's great to do focus groups with students in this because they have such a different view from faculty in terms of what's going on. Anything that faculty think are innovative, the students don't think are innovative at all. <laughs> so, you know, and, but if it makes them think out of the box and, and go far from their habit and routine, you know, sometimes those evaluations drop because they're like, okay, wait a minute, I can't plug and chug anymore. I have to actually think and show conceptually how I understand this. Oh, but they're going to be better scientists as a result. Okay, so more inclusive views of talent and creating a welcome environment. We heard this time and again. Uh, we heard campuses talking about students' assets, and students are not aware that they're coming with any assets. They actually talk to students about this. So it's happening, Marcella. She's been writing about this, but I'm saying it's very inspiring to hear people at different levels actually talking about that, not just the research, but actually how they're implementing it with students. Um, the other thing is really students becoming more aware of race, gender, and class issues. They know uh, about this, and um, there are actually <clears throat> people on campuses that are uh, helping students to understand how to respond to those issues. Um, and I think the fact that both social scientists and scientists are working on this is very important. Um, the other component is in one particular campus, they're training staff and science faculty about how this impacts URM students, but also helping them understand how race makes a difference in what they're doing, and they're actually doing critical race theory training, which is pretty amazing um, that they're actually implementing this now in practice. So it, uh, the jury's still out, we haven't finished to find out how this plays out eventually, but they're actually doing the training, and so we'll find out more about that. So I think the fact that the climate work that started pretty much you know, in education and social science is now really uh, spilling over into the science area to really understand how do we improve it, because students are not, the, you know, the, they're whole people. They're not, they, they can't all, always just only deal with the academic side, but they're whole people, so. The other co connection I think is really important, and um, I've been talking about this with some groups earlier, is the campus are engaged in what I call very powerful partnerships. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> in terms of outreach, uh, many students are transfer students at some of the sites that we were working with, um, and uh, the, the campuses are actively involved in developing partnerships with the community colleges, with early college high schools, and some of the high schools, there's a lot of them. In fact, the retention project that's generally, though they also talk up, the, the provost talked a lot about what they were doing in STEM, obviously, um, was really then all these programs where he called kind of, we have multiple touches. That is, we are doing multiple times and we actually are accounting for how many times we actually touch a particular student in a high school. They actually can monitor that now. So they're actually doing a lot about understanding how that outreach is working and then what it results in terms of them coming to campus and being successful. They're communicating more with families also, integrating them into the learning process, bringing them to understand and help support students in their, um, in their career and in their work uh, in terms of, you know, not all families understand what research is. And so they are actually involving um, communities and families in that respect. The other thing that I think is really important is that for a lot of, particularly a lot of the HSIs, they have not had the same resources that research institutions have. And so they're establishing networks of opportunities for diverse students who don't leave the local area for science training, but they use the resources through collaborative partnerships. I'll give an example. One of the campuses we visited, they actually hired someone whose job is to find equipment in industry and local institutions to find ways to train students on all that equipment and train faculty um, to make better use of the resources that are there across in the region. So now you have, for example, someone in Long Beach, for example, training people to use something at UC San Diego, right? Uh, I don't know what the machine is, but they're all, I walked into the machine, you know, they, there's machine room, right? And it was like, oh yeah, I trained this, I trained, and you know, really, I mean, this, this person that worked there, I mean, he should be in a PhD program. He was so good. 
He was training students to use the latest technology, and he said, oh yes, there are only eight of these in the country, and we have one of them. So I control, I teach people how to use it, and so then the collaboration is you bring other people from other campuses to, to also use the resources. So there's a way to really think about how do you, if you really want to think about improving um, the, the research expertise in a particular region, you know, campuses working together can do a really good job and really share those resources. This is sort of the most interesting part, and that's really thinking about culturally responsive practices. So it's like, oh, what are those? Uh, well, I think, again, this group of 10 is really defining it. One of the things that we see both at the HSIs and also the UC that I, I studied and then these 10 campuses um, that are across the country, they know their students' identities well. They know what issues low-income students face. They know that first-generation students need a little more navigation and guidance and they cannot rely on faculty, maybe siblings, uh, they rely on a lot on peers, but also institutional agents. This is one of the things that I think is a characteristic of, I think, the institutions that was so stunning to me is they know who the students are and very often in the interviews they'll say, um, we meet students where they are and we're taking them to the next level. They would say it in terms of faculty and administrators and students would say it because they believed it. They said, this faculty here will take me to the next level. So it's really great to see, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have to say it's pretty inspiring to sort of see this and that they actually do understand these students. They're not ex acting like all the students are the same in the classroom. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, some people said I treat everybody equally and therefore, you know, that's equality. No, they did not come to your doorstep equally. They are not equally resourced in whatever way you think about it. So what do you do then with the students you have? You know, if you have the best students, I tell this at UCL all the time, we have the best students we've had in the history. There shouldn't be a single student flunking, except maybe the, well, I think we figured out, I did a report for the provost, 5%, maybe because they didn't attend, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But there shouldn't be classes that flunk 30, 35% of their students. This is the best student body we've had in the history of the institution. Every single one of them should be successful. What are we doing that's not working? And I think what the institutions have decided, at least these 10, but also I'm hoping that we get there someday at UCLA, is that thinking about what is it we're doing to make sure these students are successful, right? It only reflects better on UCLA, right? It only reflects better on UC. And if you think nationally that UC will become the Hispanic serving system, guess what kind of impact you have in terms of diversifying the research workforce, diversifying the professionals, diversifying every element, right? It's huge, the impact can be huge. So again, as I said, they developed an asset best approach. They actually said, you know, for example, one uh, one faculty member said, well, they came, for example, um, the, uh, those that are admitted in the, you know, the top 9% of their class, right? Um, maybe their schools weren't the same as the schools from other students, right? But they come extremely achievement-oriented and motivated. And nationally, when we, well, not nationally, but system-wide when we looked at that data, it was true. For those that were admitted uh, in terms of the, the local eligibility context, um, they were extremely high performers. They did they well. They finished, the, they finished college and they, would, they do extremely well. So they're finding this at other institutions as well, is that if they're used to performing and they're highly motivated, we can work on the preparation part. I've heard that from faculty. The other component is really thinking about inclusive classrooms. And I had alluded earlier about a relevant health problems in the curriculum, trying to really pick issues that are gonna be relevant uh, to students. And so they understand, I have to understand more and better science to help solve those problems. But also I want to posit, it's probably new, I mean, not, but the active learning 
has reduced disparities in the classroom. It's been very powerful and a lot of places that are converting to active learning are seeing the reduction of disparities. So I want to say that's a culturally responsive practice. And that's hard because people are like, oh no, active learning, that's not culturally responsive. But you know what, if it reduces disparities, you're creating equity, you're actually doing something, you're reaching those students, right? The other component is really having authentic science experiences at early stages because it creates greater ownership of the protection of knowledge that is rather than mastering knowledge that other people developed and you must learn, which you have to know foundation-wise, is that I can also produce knowledge, right? Very empowering to, for very early on the students to learn this, that they can that not just master it, but they can actually be the producer of new knowledge is really important. And sometimes that's really key to engaging students and keeping them involved. One of the final points I think is really important, and this is still developing, but if there's huge demand for it, is they're training faculty in what they call culturally aware mentoring. There's now a group, the National Research Mentoring Network, you can go online, and nrmn.net, and they actually have a whole uh, host of things uh, to do to help improve mentoring, and then they, it's like a net, excuse me, a network. You can also connect with people on the network. A lot of it is on research training. Um, but one aspect of what they're doing is creating this culturally aware mentoring. And they're doing um, workshops across the, all across the United States, actually. And so I think this is really important because we're, we're starting to aware and recognize, be aware of identity and how that impacts both career development, learning, and also in terms of our interactions in different spaces. Um, and so I, I think this is a really good trend for us. Again, uh, the jury's still out. We're doing the evaluation on all of this. Uh, but there should be a lot uh, coming out of this in the future in terms of both what it is, how you do it, how you train for it, and also opportunities to learn it, but also now the research on how effective it has been. So I want to conclude a little bit on what we might do kind of in the future. And I call it assuming agency and responsibility in advancing diversity, particularly as our campuses become more diverse, increasing the number of Latino students. Just when we thought we had accomplished it, that we got the numbers, now the real work begins, right? All the work was focused on, let's get the numbers up, let's make sure. Now that the, everybody's here or they're actually arriving, this is where the re real work begins, right? It's like, okay, what are we going to do different? We're going to do the same thing uh, or are we going to do something different? So I think you can begin to have kind of strategy building sessions that address diversity commitment. Obviously, some of these institutions, before they became exercised, they had really looked at their history and identified points in history um, that were really key in uh, and determining uh, like big turning points in which they went from a predominantly white institution in terms of values, beliefs, expectations to really Hispanic serving kinds of institutions. Another thinking about the levels of community engagement, uh, fostering a positive campus climate. And then thinking about or rethinking in the case of this one UC campus and trying to improve its retention rates, they basically looked at their support programs, evaluated them, understand what works, what didn't work, reinstituted and did redesign. They even redesigned learning communities because they, they said th these are not as effective as they can be, right? The other component certainly is thinking about the leadership and producing some deep cultural changes that's going to change people's beliefs and attitudes and their daily practice, right? And this can happen at the grassroots level, but it also has to happen in upper levels of administration as well. So um, I have some strategies and I'm happy to um, answer questions. Here's some resources for you. The piece that's coming out on the inclusive science manuscript is this one. And the whole volume is on each of the campuses involved and what they're doing in terms of um, uh, biomedical training, it also includes social science, what each campus is doing, and some of them have engineering as part of that component, uh, but you might kind of read to see what some of the other campuses are doing 
um, nationally and that I have the lead article in that kind of framing the whole initiative. Um, but more to come because they, that uh, particular specific special issue is mostly focused on what practices they're instituting and the next set of articles will be on evaluating how effective they're becoming. So at that point, Marcella, I'm going to ask you to help me moderate, uh, help me moderate the conversation. And so I'm open to questions on anything I presented here, but also on anything else you would like to ask questions. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Pichardo, for your wonderful talk. And we have time for a few questions, so please. Oh, there's one. Thank you so much, Professor, for speaking today. Um, my question is more so around the pipeline from uh, the university to internships, uh, whether they're public policy, public service internships, or technical internships. Um, students of color historically have missed out on the opportunities really because there was a lack of information presented to them. And as a result, um, internships, you know, particularly just for example like in, in DC, are overwhelmingly, you know, white serving mm -hmm. um, internships. So my question is, are there campuses that have done a good job mm -hmm. at increasing that pipeline and what practices have they used to make that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I'm not an expert on the internship and what they do in terms of internships, but I think um, another, another uh, activity that's pretty common where students of color are kind of are not as participatory as a study abroad, for example, right? So there's a number of one you can point to that are, have been more of privileged students who kind of know these opportunities or their families position them or they know to go look for them. And so I'll say at least if the study abroad can be used as an analogy, there are some institutions that have really developed programming around a particular issue and help to sponsor study abroad, uh, working with particular countries, for example, on important uh, health problems or important issues, um, and also incorporating faculty of color in that to, to do those work, and then sort of broadly targeting students, knowing that the problem was that students of color were not participating in ways that they should. Similarly, with internships, um, they can be broadly instituted, but also thinking carefully about constructing them uh, that would be related to, and they sometimes do this with, un, with undergraduate research as well, is making sure you target those students so that they understand those activities and opportunities are there. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as a faculty member who's concerned and knows sends an email to that student, I think, I think you should apply for this, right? So it can be as simple as that, or it could be more programmatic in approach, right? Um, in the way, I'll, I'll tell you which institution was Michigan, University of Michigan actually created a program, and they consulted uh, some of us around campus about what we thought, how it would work. I thought, this is brilliant, this is great, because students are not taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, but they were structuring it in a careful way so that they were able to make sure that they attracted students. Um, our own chancellor, in fact, I got an email the other day and he basically said, we are doing a, a, a diversity DC trip and we're going to be going to all these offices and then we're going to New York and will you come along with us so we can have the conversations about identity and immigration and our history as a country. And I was like, sure, you know, I'm ready, yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, but I'm thinking the students, too, are probably, I mean, the faculty are targeted, and I'm sure the students are targeted, too. And it, he basically said there's student leaders that are going, um, but I'm also sure that they're broadly conceptualizing that student leadership to make sure that it's diverse, because it doesn't make sense to talk about diversity if it's not a diverse group that's going to be there. And what we're going to be seeing are basically some of the major uh, issues uh, or museums and everything on the camp, on the country. And so that's not exactly an internship, but it really is a targeted way, targeted way of really ensuring who's participating and the issues we're going to be talking about. 
So being, and basically it was said, we're, we're gonna really contemplate, uh, you know, the contributions, the history of diversity in this country, and we're gonna be doing this. So I was a chancellor putting the money out for that, so I said, well, last year I couldn't go, but I, this year I'm gonna go. Yeah, especially since they're going to the 9-11, um, and they're gonna be doing a lot of very interesting things. So, yeah, even as a faculty member, I'm like, wow, I've never been to some of those places. I would love to do that and then have an opportunity to talk with students about it, so it's great. So, again, you know, how long he'll do it, I don't know, or some of these things, but if you can institutionalize it as a program, it's very useful. But again, it's like, you as an institutional agent, you need to be telling students, particularly first generation, low income students who may not think um, they can do it, or they don't even know that they, they could be funded to do this, right? Thank you for the question. I wanted to go back to your, one of your first slides about the gap between Latino enrollment and faculty yeah. numbers. So our college, College of Ag and Environmental Sciences, was part of a UC-wide pilot uh, project this past year that uh, there was special allocation from the state legislature mm -hmm. designed to increase faculty diversity. We were very successful in increasing diversity in a variety of ways, gender, sexual orientation, cultural groups, a number of different demographic groups, we were not successful mm -hmm. with Latinos. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, in your work and the work with these various campuses, have you found good models of that and what, if anything, works? Wow, okay, so there's several things I think that I see these campuses doing that um, kind of stands out for me is they realize, for example, some of these campuses, they're close to broad access. In fact, one of the universities is open access institution. And it's close to the border, so guess what? It, there are Latinos there, right? <laughs> there are lots of Latinos there. They are working with institutions across the country for undergraduate research uh, programs, for internships. Um, and they know they have to actively work with their students who are mostly low income, first generation, et cetera. They know they have to do that. So they are also pairing, not for just those temporary things, but they clearly are gonna position their students for graduate school, because guess what, that's what NIH is paying for, for these students to end up in graduate school. So it's not just one, but there are at least 10 institutions that are gonna be positioning their students for graduate school. So if, I think the thing is, is really thinking about the pipeline. Now that's long-term thinking for faculty recruitment, but I know another university would do this, is they would have a summer kind of um, institute for students that were n near the end of their graduate program. And they typically tapped into faculty context and said, we want to definitely have a diverse group, so send a diverse group. So I would do a session on the tenure track process. I mean, it's literally preparing graduate students to be ready to be assistant professors. And the thing is, they were doing it, this was in Colorado, so they did it kind of for the system, um, but they, uh, that institution was not gonna be guaranteed that we're gonna get any, any one of those, right? But what they can be, glad about is they increased so many more people who are gonna be better informed about stepping into that first assistant professor role and when they came, here's the trick, of course this was a private institution that did this in Denver, but they also bring the Colorado system involved in the process because they had the money actually, the private institution had the money. Um, they actually then set up interviews on campus. So they actually created a pathway Right? It's like, we're not gonna wait for that FTE line to open. We might be able to get that FTE line uh, if we uh, can identify really strong candidates. And there were some fabulous people from all disciplines going to this particular, um, it, I, I would say, pre-graduation kind of orientation in terms of the next step. I could see a lot of graduate students in the particular programs that might be relevant to your areas um, very interested in this. So, but it's really then targeting, getting some targeting 
going so you have the diversification. And it was the campus diversity office that was paying for, officer that was paying for this at this private university and said, we're not sure we're going to get any of these, but we're going to do it. Right? So there's different ways, thinking about different stages of the pipeline and campuses you might be able to work with. Ah, Natalia. So again, thank you for your presentation. So um, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, helping our students navigate power dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how I can do that when I myself don't even know how to navigate <laughs> power right. dynamics. Uh, that was actually for administrators. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, for, well, the, um, for all of us, basically. We yeah, and, and I'm saying this because <laughs> I know a lot of the people who are here in the room who daily are working yes. around issues of diversity, of improving campus climate, mm -hmm. um, and are daily challenging yes. at multiple levels at this university mm -hmm. issues of racism, of yeah. inclusivity, and, um, and we find that um, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to find mm -hmm. institutional commitment mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, we're under resourced or we do the retention work for the university, et cetera, et cetera. And so <laughs> I'm wondering how um, those systemic changes can be done mm -hmm. when the when we ourselves don't even know how to be at the table of those important yeah. conversations. Like the HSI thing is going to happen, and w we don't even know who's at the table, mm -hmm. and we are the ones who are committed to it. Right. Uh, or uh, how can we? Uh, support programs for our students and the retention of our students when this El Centro, the retention center, is completely underfunded mm -hmm. and the people who work there go from yearly, um, mm -hmm. they're just hired yearly and mm -hmm. at very low yeah. wages. So, so I'm, yeah, I want okay. you. So think one, and one is sorry, the, there, the, institu the institution does face external pressures, particularly the retention issue. Something's got to change in that area because if more people are committed, what's working, right, and what can work better, I think is really important for the campus to do. And so many of the campuses are talking about what to do better. And in the past, those uh, smaller programs or units were, okay, you know, languishing or whatever, but now it's become more important, right? So it's something about, you know, the interest convergence, right? It's like, okay, now we have our interests converge. So there are, just give you an idea, there are windows of opportunity for all these things. Um, and so, um, in fact, in the policy gr group, they talk about policy windows, is there's a chance when it, this can pass and that's because, or what your idea might be a really good one, but it's time hasn't come yet. Nobody's willing to hear it and tell really, they need something, right? It happened to me when I tried to change teaching and learning, right? I had written something on tenure guidelines for this. They threw them back at me and said, oh no, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Then the provost later said, every unit must have it. And they said, oh, they pulled them out of the garbage can. And they said, here they are, here are ours, right? It's like, so eventually your idea might become more salient uh, when it's really in need. Okay, that's not a lot of hope I'm giving you, but if, <laughs> if you want some guidance, if you want some guidance, uh, one of my former grad students, and she's now a tenure professor at USC, is Adriana Kizar in Leicester. She has a book called Grassroots Leadership. And she had been studying presidential leadership for a long time, and her students were like, hey, what about the rest of us? You're only talking about presidents and what they're doing. What's happening at the grassroots level, and what's great is then she did case studies at multiple institutions and multiple cases of change looking at only the grassroots leaders and how they achieved it. She's got two chapters on power dynamics. And let me tell you, it's ugly, and you know it already, right? But she documents the bullying, potential firing, all those things that happen when people are trying to make change. But what's good is there's also a chapter on self-preservation, 
how people stay committed. It's coalition building, it's collective, it's working with like-minded people. They're the things that keep you and sustain you in your change process as you're trying to do. You care about the students, you care about this institution or you wouldn't still be here, right? So somehow people have to start to figure that out. It's just, it's a big threat. And when I talk about some of these things, I'm talking about changing what went on before. And I'm just giving you examples of institutions that are actually doing it. So I think it's real important. Anyway, read the book. It will help, hopefully. And, and it's the only place that I've seen power dynamics addressed, dynamics addressed. I hate to say it, but some, some changes take many years. And sometimes it's changing leadership. It's a lot of things that have to happen. But I think it's instructive in seeing the examples that she refers to. Thank you, Silvia. So one of the things you mentioned was, are we Hispanic enrolling or mm -hmm. are we Hispanic serving? Can you kind of just share with us yeah. what good institutions are doing who are really serving yeah. these students? Yeah, well, I, I, the example I was giving, um, particularly quoting this provost, I think that institution is doing it. And it's because to a person that we identified is they clearly got their students. They knew they were first generation. They knew they were low income and that these are our students. And as like the provost said, you can't help but root for their success because they're so committed, they're strong, they've overcome adversity, they've done all these things. And so it was great to hear that from upper level administrators, from faculty, from mid-level leaders to a person. It's, it was a cultural change on that campus, but it happened a long time ago. And now they're just building on that momentum to really make the institution work. And I gave the example of changing what departments are doing. We've stopped changing our students, right? We're changing what departments are doing. We're changing what the institution's doing, right? That's what's so exciting about this, is that they're clearly Hispanic serving or enhancing or thriving, right? the new definitions of where you go with, a, with that. Um, so it was a lot of fun, but we, I'll have to say quantitatively we did the analysis. We didn't know what we were gonna find. And when we got there, I think, well, Abby was there. She went to do some of the interviews with me, um, is that um, it was very inspiring to, to hear that because it was a UC campus and, and they were, totally accepting and and they were they were building success they were building success and now national recognition right also for that success um, and that's rare for most HSIs go under appreciated and un like under the radar right that's going to change with UC campuses I think Uh, once again, thank you for your presentation and especially for your scholarship in this area. Very important contribution. Uh, a number of scholars have been focusing on the whole issue of gross inequality in our society. Mm -hmm. And Robert Reich produced recently a, a video on inequality for everybody. A number of your slides identified social class mm -hmm. and low income families, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How is that being addressed at universities and what are we doing uh, with that particular issue that's facing our society. Yeah, that's, it's, that's very important because one of the things that we've been very good at this country is kind of um, saying, well, we're not Europe, we don't have those class distinctions, right? But um, I'll, I'll tell you what's not happening and when we do uh, studies particularly of low-income students, even those that get completely funded because almost to a person in this UC case study, they said, California compared to other institutions, we really do financially support our students, okay? But for, uh, we did a study of high achieving low income students and one of the things we found is even those that got things paid for, there were things in their daily lives that were not paid for, that they had to reconsider. A class trip, right? Um, the assumption that you have a computer or even the assumption that you have a cell phone. Almost every student has a cell phone. Every now and then I have to ask in my class in UCLA, 
does everyone have, a, we do polling, right? Um, does everyone have a cell phone? Invariably, one student does not have one. They are very low income. Some of the students are very low income. But invariably, another person has two. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're gonna use, can you let that person borrow your phone? Yes, to do the polling. Two phones, go figure. Right? So, uh, yeah, in our campuses, we have this huge disparity on the students. And we have students using the UCLA, we have called something called a food closet, right? We have things like that. Yep. 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 Yes. No, so there are, there are real things. And the faculty in the classroom don't understand that those class differences exist. And so they ask students to do things that they would ask middle or upper class students to do. And another thing we found in some of our data is that students will go to buy older editions of the books or borrow them or rent them to not have to pay for them. So one of the things we're trying to make our faculty more aware of is the cost of those texts. And I know there was legislation in the state about you have to, within a certain period of time, know in advance what that text is going to be. And invariably, we have to encourage faculty to really think about alternative ways of getting that information. And very often I say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna use a campus bookstore. Go on these three sites, you're gonna find the lowest cost books there that I'm gonna require for this class. Sometimes the student, we have to train students to do that because that's, the faculty are not doing that for them. But I take that as something because the students in my dialogue class have made me very aware of these differences um, and what big difference it makes. I uh, have even had students who have been homeless. So the assumptions are not the same that you can have. And so I can imagine, I'm aware of it because we do dialogue, right? And students reveal this aspect of their identities, but in science classrooms and elsewhere, they're not sharing that. Even as high achievers as they are, they're not always sharing that. So. Uh, systematically, I think our campuses are doing some of the things by having the food closet, by doing certain things they are doing, but I think in the classroom we're not there yet in uh, recognizing that. We have time for one more question. Hello. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation that um, at the beginning the focus was on getting the numbers up and you know getting these students here and it seemed like it was an afterthought that the what um, happened once they were all here yeah like once they were all here so I was wondering what like your thought your take is on that because I understand like I'm sure there's like money involved and like having the numbers first will like help with the cause of like oh this is how we have the we have the numbers now so that's another reason to like make this an institution, but like, why is that an afterthought? And I just wanted to know your, um, yeah, your opinion on that. That's, that's a group, great group discussion, by the way. <laughs> well, let me just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into dialogue mode. But anyway, um, the uh, it has been a struggle, and the numbers are necessary but not sufficient for intergroup relations. It's the same thing, here's a diverse group, right? You're not interacting with each other, you would learn more if you interacted with each other. So it's, it's bringing you here is not enough. Is that the interaction that we have with each other, the questions you're asking, how you're learning from each other is what's important. And I think that um, those institutions, and I became, you know, I started with that group of institutions, more elite colleges that were fighting to get those numbers up. And then I realized they weren't fighting that hard to get the numbers up. You know, they wanted the best of the best, the best of the best, the way it was narrowly defined. And other campuses were doing the bulk of that work. But they knew their work was going to be different. And in fact, most Hispanic serving institutions know their work is different. They recognize their work is different. They recognize the commitment to diversity. They recognize the fastest way to get students to graduate is not to admit students who have any chance of not graduating, that are any risk whatsoever. 
And what I'm hearing from these campuses is we're not going to make that trade-off. We want this to be a diverse campus. So we're going to keep raising the retention rates without raising our admission standards, without affecting our diversity. They're actually getting actually stronger, academically stronger, but we're not going to change the diversity of this campus. I mean, they may, be, they may have fewer students that require any kind of developmental education, right, or, um, you know, pre-101 courses that some of our campuses offer, still offer, um, but they are really committed, the faculty are really committed to the diversity. So the intergroup relations part, that's the new stuff I got involved in because I realized that there were, and first of all, the diversity in California is very different from Michigan, it's where I started my academic career, right? The numbers were smaller. So we were making the most of diversity there, and California with a, a lot of diversity institutions was doing nothing with their diversity. So we've started a dialogue programs to really say, it's such a rich group of students, the best we've ever had in the history of UC. So we should really be doing the best that we can in terms of helping them to become part of a diverse democracy. So, you know, we've been, as I said, I think this is the new work to do is really how you really make the most of the diversity you have now that you have it, right? And what I'm seeing for the HSIs is they had to at some point turn that institutional identity, change what they were doing. And I'm hearing that talk, some of that talk. It might not be true of every institution, but certainly, and it's hard. It's hard, right, to make those changes. But it's like, hey, it's, the campus is changing. And how, how is what we do? I mean, the one thing that's great about high, American higher education is very stable. The one thing that's bad about American higher education is very stable. <laughs> I, I teach the introduction class. I said, so we have in the system a very stable system, but we have those experimenting college around the edges, and all of us are trying to say, yeah, you go ahead and experiment with that, with active learning stuff. We'll see how it works first before we adopt it, right? So we're really good at that. And then it's like, hey, it's really working there and they're getting famous for it, we're gonna do it, right? So there's a way of when the system is able to maintain its stability but also innovate. So, but anyway, I was saying earlier is that I couldn't do this work if I weren't an optimist. That I really believe that it can change, that we can get to a vision of where we believe America should be and where our campuses should be. So. I'm going to leave you with that optimistic vision. <laughs>